Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm Harold Drager. I'm Norwegian, and I live in Norway, so it's a long way to get here. Uh, I do go by Cape Town, and I will go the same route back. But uh, being here is a pleasure, meeting all of you. I was here actually four years ago in 2019, and uh, I know a few of you, and it's good to see you again. And I would like to start to thank Roman Tandlich, who is our president in the South African chapter for the marvelous job he has been doing by getting this off the ground and actually getting all of you into this uh, conference. I know he's not alone about this. He has people with him. I don't know all your names, but I like to recognize the great work you have been doing. I also like to extend my gratitude to Stenden for opening up their rooms for us and cooperating with us. That's very important for us. And the same with uh, Rhodes, who together with Stenden are supporting this activity. Um, Roman mentioned uh, the start of this uh, organization. Actually, I took the initiative to this back in 1993. And we did actually the first putting together this during a conference, another type of conference in Washington, DC, back in 1993, was a group in a hotel room in Washington, DC with international. We said that it's a need to focus on emergency management as such. And uh, since then, we have been traveling the world. We started out I was the vice president from the start on because uh, I had my own company, my own activity. But uh, I followed this and I have followed this organization for 30 years, took over as president in 2002. And since then, we have extended it more internationally. The first years we started, we had the first conference we had in Fort Lauderdale in uh, Florida in US, the second one in Europe, and then we went back and forth over the Atlantic with, and the main focus of the conference was, uh, a main focus of the organization was conferences, meeting, exchanging experience, presenting papers. I took over as uh, president in 2-2, and I saw that we should be international and it should have something we should focus on and bring back in order to improve the safety worldwide. And at that time, we started out with chapters and that has been growing. I will tell you more about this tomorrow, but today we are about 16 chapters. And uh, up to, to 19, we, we could gather people actually uh, and uh, coming to the conferences, but the pandemic actually changed the world. We learned about Teams and Zoom and all the conference tools. And you know, it's expensive to travel. And uh, in order to have a bigger public, we actually do this. We, in, during the pande pandemic, we had to change how do we do things. And then we did, did two virtual conferences. And last year in Atlanta, in the US, we did the first hybrid <coughs> conference with people present in the audience and all virtual at the same time. And this, uh, I, we, we felt this was a good concept. And when Roman was willing to take on the responsibility here, uh, I saw the opportunity that we can focus on a local community, a local uh, country with their issues on emergencies and safety. And that we can bring those to the rest of the organization. So during this conference, we focus on you. You are running this, you are the chairs, you bring these uh, messages out. We have papers from all over the world. Actually, we have more than 100 presentations during this week, many of them virtual, of course. 
that these presenters are coming from 30 countries. So you are reaching far out. And this is the idea. We need to communicate. We need to uh, try to learn from our experience. And next year, we will actually go to India. And what we do here you know, in South Africa will be actually the model for how do we proceed to India. We like to know the flavor of being here. What is South Africa? What can you bring to the table? We have to learn from you. And we always also focus on the networking and the local cuisine. So looking forward for uh, actually also tasting that. Mm -hmm. On the way, when I was picked up, me and me was picked up in uh, Port Elizabeth, we stopped for a dinner. First time in my life, I had kudu. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what kudu was, but it was a delicious meal. And uh, and I have told everybody. I even put it on my uh, my uh, Facebook and Instagram account. So uh, I try to get my experience out to the world. Uh, I won't keep much time, but I will say I'm very delighted to be here, given the opportunity to meet you all. And um, Today, in parallel with when you do present papers and you get papers in from the rest of the world, I will do the um, uh, workshop on our certification. Uh, certification, I think, is important. We the, And the idea behind the certification is we have to have a common understanding of what is emergency management and disaster response so we can communicate. So we know wherever we go that they have the same way of thinking of emotions and management. And this is the idea. And we, in that, we put some uh, ground knowledge which we think people should know. And then we have an exam on that and we certify and then we build up this group. And for those of you coming to the parallel room here, I will go through more of you with that. Roman uh, told you where we were doing research, conferences, certification, but we have added one more thing to what we like to focus on. And that is, uh, for example, chat GPT. The AI is coming in and many people think this might be a threat. Are the computer system, the software taking over and can we control this? I do think, I myself, I'm an engineer by education, and my, actually, I was educated in 1967, so I'm an old man. That <laughs> uh, my major at that time was cybernetics. And for me, AI is only an algorithm. And if we do the algorithm right, we can use this to the benefit. And for example, for emotions in management, we have a vast, vast number of experiences and background. How can we uh, digest all this information and give an answer in a very quick way? So in that respect, I think we can use it. But we are looking into this as an organization. And that's why we also have a panel on use of AI. So uh, with those words, again, I'm so happy to be here meet all of you and uh, experience what South Africa do in emergency management. And again, thanks for all of you to join us in this effort. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my uh, honor to welcome you to stand in South Africa. And uh, yeah, I can only start off by saying what a milestone this is for us as a, as a small private higher education institution in South Africa to, to host this week um, and uh, accommodate you. Um, it's just over a decade ago that we um, had a moment that we thought, okay, we've been um, here now for about a decade in South Africa with Dutch institution by origin. Um, what is our second program going to be? And specifically, Mr. Elroy Tai, he's sitting here with you. If you want to have the inscope of, of, of the story, you can ask him over the break. 
uh, we started doing some research and we saw a huge skill, skills gap in, in disaster relief management. Our main campus at the time was um, toying with the idea of launching a degree in humanitarian assistance management. But the Dutch government wasn't really excited. Uh, at the time, there was a sort of wild growth of different specializations in degrees and they actually wanted to bring the range of degrees in higher education back. So that program had ended up on the shelf. And um, Elroy and I took the program and started traveling, engaging with government and engaging with different stakeholders. And everyone we spoke to said, no, we need this in, not just in South Africa, in Africa. Uh, we are the continent that is, is plagued uh, almost constantly by different kinds of disasters. And we need to build this capacity here. Um, so we decided to go ahead. And uh, yeah, over the last 10 years, We've, we've seen the program grow, we've seen our relations grow, and we've also seen our students grow. And what is, what is really special for me this week is that, uh, that Roman has said, no, look, there are seats available, fill them with your students, give them this opportunity. So to the students, I would say really um, realize what opportunity you have this week to, to sit here and, and hear from uh, the world's leading authorities what is going on and what is happening in your field. Um, very similar to our first program, which was the Bachelor's of Commerce in Hospitality Management. Um, the industry has been a bit confused. Okay, now what, what is this, uh, this graduate that you're presenting us? But with each graduation, we see and we hear um, more recognition of, of what our graduates can do and, and, and what their place is in the industry. And it, it's almost a parallel with the professionalization of the industry as a whole, perhaps really starting to take off after 9-11 saying, hey, we need to do something in terms of our disaster and, and uh, emergency preparedness, uh, not just in Africa, but globally. Um, so I believe that this is a, a field that will continue to professionalize and, and grow um, and uh, need very capable individuals. Uh, I joined Harold in, in uh, the sentiment that that uh, AI is a tool, it's not the solution, uh, and especially in, in, in a humanitarian field, um, I think it's going to be a long time before computers can take away the, the role of the uh, professional that engages with communities and, and other stakeholders. Um, as we're the host, um, just want to assert to you that the toilets <laughs> are, as you go out on the left, Everyone, all our students are in uniform today. We asked them to come in uniform today so you can clearly recognize them. They know where everything is here because they sort of live here. Um, so please, if, if you need for anything, feel free to ask them. They're not just attendees, they're also your hosts. Um, and of course, they're very keen to meet you and to learn from, from, from you as well. Um, the coffee break room was already uh, established. Um, yeah, and there's staff on standby throughout the conference. So with... That I, I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for making the journey to <laughs> what feels like the middle of nowhere, but uh, there is a lot of stuff happening here in Port Alfred, and I hope you're going to have an awesome week. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to both of our hosts and um, senior members of the hosting institutions uh, for opening the conference. Um, at your registration, you would have received a packet that looks like this, among other things. Hopefully the goodies in your bags will give you an idea about some of the approaches that we have. Um, if the conference programs are not available, please feel free to uh, proceed to the registration desk and get them. We will also provide electronic copies of the abstract book and everything else. The abstract book is preliminary. Uh, there are still full papers, which we will um, finalize the review of and publication of the proceedings after the conference. At the same time, uh, we will be looking to recognize excellence among the presenters and the, the invited speakers and also excellence among uh, the next generation of professions that we're trying to um, established networks amongst. Based on this, um, there will be three um, levels of 
uh, recognition that we would like to extend to existing and seasoned professionals. Um, these will be keynote speakers that you will be clearly um, be provided with indications about who they are. They are distinguished academics and practitioners who have proven themselves as leaders in the field of emergency and disaster risk management. And um, at the same time, there will be um, um, best paper, which we will award for the best presentation and paper at the conference. These will be for senior academics or practitioners. And then we will also have first, second and third place for um, student presentations. Um, there is a kind of a small jury or committee that will look at these presentations and papers and announce our decision at the end of the conference. We have tried something different this year, and that is that we generally have, at the same time as the conference is running, we have the annual general meeting or annual general assembly of teams as an organization, where we either elect office bearers to the board uh, to the board of directors. At the moment, we will be uh, voting for secretary, I think, and also some other positions. And um, anyone who attends our conference is out officially for one year becoming a member of the organization, which is completely voluntary on your part to take up. So the AGM will be, is in your packet uh, in the program. It is scheduled for tomorrow, the 12th of, um, the 12th of September, specifically 12 o'clock. Yes. So it will be just before lunch tomorrow and a special link will be provided for Zoom participants. But um, uh, further logistics will be announced tomorrow at the beginning of the daily program. Um, I think we've covered all the, we will have a gala and a welcome function taking place tomorrow night and Wednesday night. Um, invitations and um, further logistics will be announced this afternoon. All right. And without further ado, I would like to then hand over to the chairperson of the first day who is Dr. Julia Chipomuro. Dr. Chipomuro is a distinguished academic and currently the academic dean of both schools at Stendhal, South Africa. She has a background uh, in um, hospitality management, but has also recently taken over running of the disaster management um, school. Um, she's widely published with the um, expertise um, that is relevant to the conference. And she will also be delivering a keynote later on in the week. Um, and she will then basically follow, we will follow the following um, um, introductions um, throughout the conference. We will ask that um, we will list the name and the institution or the organization that a speaker um, is representing. And we would like to then ask you to provide two or three sentences about presenting yourself. The reason is that the best speaker for yourself, and the best person who knows you, the identity of the person who is exposed to crises, emergencies and disasters is the person themselves. It is important to give the voice to the individual as a part of the collective. We will also then provide more information about our keynote speakers and specifically their background and why they were invited to deliver these keynote addresses. So without further ado, I'll turn over to Juliet and Thank you very much. Please enjoy the conference. And if you have any questions about Teams or any relevant in activities, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Independent South Africa. Hey, thank you very much, Roman, for that introduction. My name is Juliet Chipumoro, and I'm the academic dean of the programs that we run here in Port Alfred. I've taken over the academic dean of the disaster management program since last year in July. And I'm very pleased to see quite a number of people who are here. We have been helping us in making sure that the program is successful. My duty today is basically to be chairing the sessions that we are going to have today. And our first session is going to be on a Southern African Disaster Risk Management and human, human Security. We are going to take two presentations and each presentation is strictly 20 minutes. So what I'm gonna uh, uh, encourage you to do is to present at least maybe for 15 minutes 
allow people to answer questions, to ask questions, and you can answer uh, before the elapse of 20 minutes so that we can then move on to the next speaker. We are going to have our tea break, mm -hmm. is my executive dean said at 10 o'clock. So at 10 o'clock, we are all going to go into the room that's just close by uh, to the auditorium where we are going to have our tea. Uh, but before the tea, we are going to have two presenters who are going to be presenting to us on the theme that I've just told you, Southern African Disaster Risk Management and Human Security. Our first speakers for the day are Sunna Meyer and Eric Tistoch from the Northwest University. And their presentation is going to be on the status quo of the brigade services in the Northwest province and the relationship with the fire Protection Association. If the presenters are here already, please move. Mulweni manene nani manene kase? Both them have to bet. That's especially for you, Mr. Driver. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor and a privilege to stand in front of such a group of people. Uh, my colleague Suna is sitting at the back. Uh, I think what usually happens is um, I am told that I'm the trained monkey back home and I'm the, I'm the Jack Russell that they use to go and attack everybody and make a lot of noise. However, at this conference, we are hoping to put on the international platform, the problems that we are experiencing in the Northwest province. My name is Eric Tavostoch. I'm the chairman of the Northwest Umbrella Fire Protection Association. And I'm also an extraordinary researcher and a professional associate at the Northwest University. We represent in the Northwest Umbrella Fire Protection Association about 4 million people. The area that we cover is about 10,484,000 hectares. Now, this is not normal in umbrella fire protection associations because what we are told that we're supposed to do is to have paid up members. And we went against the grain. We decided we would represent the people in the community who need us most. And if they can join us and pay membership fee, then so be it. But we are not going to discriminate against disabled people, old people, youth, women, people in the rural areas and tribal authorities because they cannot afford to join. The Northwest Umbrella Fire Protection Association is also the only fire protection association that represents the Provincial House of Traditional and Khoisan leaders. We have sitting on our executive five traditional leaders, including the chairman of the House of traditional and Khoisan leaders. And on our management committee, we have Kosi Mutibi, who is the only woman who is a traditional leader in the province. Why I'm giving you this background is so that you understand where we come from when we do the presentation. Professionally, I am an industrial and an environmental sociologist, but I'm studying disaster management and I've been involved in firefighting for quite some time. Suna is busy doing her studies in the status quo of fire brigade services. And when we looked at what is happening in the fire brigade services in our province and the problems that we are experiencing with regard to support that we are getting from government, we realized that a large part of the problem is non-compliance of government entities. In terms of the Felton Forest Fire Act, number 101 of 1998 in South Africa, all municipalities, all state-owned enterprises, and all government departments are supposed to be, it actually says, must be members of the Fire Protection Association. But we, because we have a very progressive constitution in our country, it says that you've got freedom of association. So they can't force somebody who is a private individual to be a member of the Fire Protection Association. But you can force government because it's a, a state institution. So the private members 
have got the right to be a member of the Fire Protection Association or they've got the right not to be. However, even if you're not a member, the Act is binding upon you. And the rules and regulations determined by the Fire Protection Association are binding upon you. This picture that you see here is a fire that started on military ground in the Pochestrum area where I come from. And on the left in this area, if you can see the cursor, Sorry. Let me do it the old fashioned way then. You can get my pen out of my pocket, so it must not be really. Um, on this side here, on the left hand side, is my own farm. And on this side is the military training ground where they teach people how to shoot with howitzers and mortars, and it's a rather dangerous area. However, this fire was started by poachers who were illegally hunting with dogs on the military grounds. And along this road here, we have to make a fire break every year to prevent these fires from going into the farms and then burning down the local municipality and the houses in the area. However, Fire brigade services to which I'm referring are not only the fire brigade services of the municipality, but also of institutions like the military. And for the last couple of years, the equipment and the manpower in the military has also been lacking. So the fire break here was actually made by the Northwest Umbrella Fire Protection Association, to which I will now refer as NUFPA and our students. Had we not made the fire break there, with the students, my own farm would have burned down. And this is actually quite scary because the fire line here was about seven and a half kilometers long. And as the head of the fire progressed, because it was driven by a northerly wind, that means it was going from the bottom of the page up to the top in that direction towards the military ground. My son and some of the students were driving along the road during the day because we picked up this fire, I think at about nine o'clock in the morning when the poachers were there. And the fire ran towards the military base. The military uh, officials or soldiers actually ran away from the fire. It was embarrassing. And I went in with my, uh, I think you call it a truck in America, we call it a bucky in South Africa, but it's a, a small uh, vehicle with a 600 liter water pump on the back. And we went in with three girls and we protected the military vehicles, two military bases, and we activated a helicopter, a spotter plane, and then after an hour, the military fire brigade only arrived. The local municipality only arrived and they are, was probably five to seven kilometers away from where the fire started. We also protected a hospital for mentally uh, disabled people. And it was actually scary to see the people come out in their underpants and stand outside and look at the helicopter dumping the water around the hospital. It made me realize the importance of the Umbrella Fire Protection Association and the local volunteers, because we are all volunteers, we're not paid. We do it at own risk, with our own vehicles, in our own time, without any support from government really. If you look at this, um, this video, I'm gonna show you here, this incident happened last year at a local municipality about um, 40, 50 kilometers from Johannesburg. Oh, sorry, I've gone one on. This happened uh, at 20, this happened um, on the 29th of August. Uh, uh, yes, of August. One day after I presented to the Provincial Disaster Management Center that the fire brigade service in the area was not in a position to protect the community because they had one Toyota Land Cruiser with 500 liter tank on. They had a 3000 liter medium pumper if I didn't do that, the lady wouldn't go away. Um, 
And they had two fire vehicles that could go out to go and assist. But what's interesting, last year they were given a brand new fire truck, a huge one, but it couldn't go out to the fire because for a year it's been in the uh, fire brigade, but it was unlicensed, so they couldn't send it out. Now, these are the type of problems that we're experiencing on the ground. This one here was an incident that happened in a place called Kitling Rafir in Costa. Now, I don't know if you're going to see it all that well. Um, I really battled to get a better, uh, a better, sorry. I think I'm better at fighting fires than working on computers. Now, have a look at this. You'll see the fire truck arrive at the event without water, and the community are bringing water in buckets to fill the fire truck. Mm -hmm. That is embarrassing, ladies and gentlemen. People were burnt, shops were destroyed, businesses and livelihoods were destroyed. And when I mention this, and I go to a meeting and I go to the fire brigade chief's meeting, or I go to the provincial disaster management meeting, I'm told that I'm not a good comrade because I'm attacking the fire brigade service in public. And I want to state this categorically. I am not attacking the fire brigade service. I am not attacking my colleagues in the fire brigade service. I'm actually <coughs> fighting for them. The problem here is created by politicians and officials who are putting the people who are trying to do the work in danger because the equipment doesn't work, they don't have hydrants that are checked, there's no enforcement of the law. And then what South Africa did, and I don't think this happens anywhere else that I'm aware of, but under the apartheid government, and I didn't want to talk politics, so I'm not talking politics, I'm a social scientist, I'm telling you facts. There was a municipality, which was basically the white municipality, they had a colored area, an Indian area, in a black area. Now, the colored area is people of mixed race or our friends from overseas. And those people were basically covered by the fire brigade service. And the rural areas and the farming areas around us were covered by what was known as by the Regional Services Council. And they looked after that area. But our government, in their wisdom, now have come up with an idea of saying border to border municipalities. But they never increased the number of people in the fire brigade. They never increased the number of satellite stations or the equipment. So what is now happening is the fire brigade service, if you phone them, would say, sorry, we only handle structural fires. We don't do felt fires or wildfires. And that has now become the responsibility of the volunteers or the fire protection association. These are our provinces in South Africa. And um, each, what we have done in the Northwest is per municipality, we've got one fire protection association and it's linked to the geopolitical borders. However, there's a little country called Botswana, which is above us. And these municipalities here border <laughs> on Botswana. And unfortunately, once again, our government has not taken this into consideration because the majority of the prevailing winds are northerly or northwesterly winds that come in. And we are constantly having now to fight fires on the Botswana border coming into South Africa or fires coming from our area going into Botswana. I'm waiting for the day that this forms an international conflict because this is on its way and it will be one of the papers that the uh, we are presenting on a little bit later today. However, if you have a look at the size of A, and that is Tafi Sanamuropo, we have two FPAs in this area. But there's a problem because the one area is traditionally commercial farming, which is the Muropo FPA, and the Kahisano area comes out of the Bantustan days of the old Baputatuana or the Republic of Baputatuana in the days of apartheid. And this is mainly people who come out of a traditional uh, background or are rural emerging farmers in terms of uh, the new government restitution of land. 
uh, to put it plainly, it's a traditionally black farmers, and the Mulopo area would have about 50% white farmers and black. And I don't want to mention it as a black-white issue because fires affect everybody. However, the traditional mentality of the black farmers in the area is you burn the fields at this time of the year so that you can actually get green grass coming up for your sheep and goats. They also use fires to get rid of invasive species. However, the people don't know that climate has changed. It's a big problem that we're experiencing. And fires are no longer controllable in the traditional ways, and the fires are running out of control. These are a list of our municipalities, as well as the Fire Protection Association. And we have four districts and 20 local fire protection associations. This is just an example to show you a very well-to-do house that was burnt and a shack that was burnt. A house that is going to get burnt and a house that is burning. And the reason for this is because the fire brigade services don't have the manpower or the equipment to go and help. So it has become the job of the Fire Protection Association. So we've become the de facto fire brigade service in the area. Here is an incident which led to two head-on collisions. As you can see, there's no fire break on the side of the road and the fields were burning. Somebody had stopped on the side of the road to relieve themselves, took his cigarette, but threw it on the ground and got back in his car and left and it started the fire. And how do I know this? There were security cameras on the T-junction where it actually happened and where the fire started. But what now happens is you can't get the traffic department out. So it's not only on the fire brigade services where we have problems, but in the rural areas to get somebody out there at 60 or 70 kilometers away from the fire brigade, they don't have satellite stations, they don't have the traffic coming out, the smoke crossing the road, vehicles uh, go through, and then you have this type of crash. In this collision here, two people died, the one lady, was transporting fruit and vegetables to her little uh, shop. And the other lady, and she was crushed to death, and the other lady actually burned alive in her car because <laughs> the fire department couldn't come and get her out of the car in time. And that was a major problem. We've got the act which basically tells you what you have to do. Here, we have volunteers and students making a fire break. And in South Africa, fire break means that you remove all combustible material. So there are three ways of doing that. You can burn, you can grade, or you can spray poison. But don't tell me that you're cutting the grass and it's a, and it's a fire break because you haven't removed the combustible material. We have got peace officers who've been trained but not appointed, so we can't enforce. What the peace officer would do, he, he would give a notice of compliance and then be able to summon you to go to court. We don't have one municipality that I'm aware of in our province that can actually do this because they don't have peace officers who are appointed. This, unfortunately, is what we are experiencing now. We are slap bang in the middle of our fire season. We've lost hundreds of livestock and game. We've had four people dying and we've had more than 25 people injured. This is our this is actual. This is an incident command post in the felt because the municipalities don't have an incident command post. Suna and I attended a fire, a very big fire last year, which was raised, raging for about 31 days in the area, but it was a number of small fires. And when we got to the incident command post, they didn't have a map, they didn't have electricity, they didn't have water in the building and there were no toilets working. And when we brought the people into the staging post, they gave the firefighters who come from Eastern Cape, Gauteng and Free State, which are neighboring provinces, breakfast or brunch at about half past 11 on the Sunday. And they gave them, I think it was four slices of bread with butter on and black coffee without sugar. That was it. So we have a problem. Here is a sand table where the students are being trained how to use it. And there we actually went and built up the map of the area to show the people where the fires are. Um, this is just the FPA working with technology to do it that none of the municipalities have in our province. Um, if you have a look at this picture here, this is very heartbreaking that the baby and the mother both died in the fire. 
This is a petrol bomb that was thrown into one of the farm areas. And this is a big problem that we're experiencing now. There's a lot of arson that is taking place. We don't know why, but it started after the riots that we had in the KwaZulu Natal area two years ago, and it's continued into our province. This is our incident command team, it's our strike team that went out with a helicopter. And so far in the last about six weeks, we've activated 179.28 hours of a possible 200 that were allocated for the whole country. And we in the province act activated for 179.28 hours. This is what a fire danger index looks like. And here you can see non-compliance from government departments. Ladies and gentlemen, this was last night. I put it on last night. Now I want to ask the question. Do you think the fire danger ends at the national border or the international border or the provincial border? I mean, I find it very strange that the red is on the one side of a border and the other side is orange. Somewhere along the line, we need technology and the municipalities aren't in a position to do this or the fire brigade services. Here we've got, once again, the readiness, what everybody must do, what everybody must know. And unfortunately, government is our biggest problem child. About 60% of fires are created by the municipalities uh, in our area. And I think I have now run out of time. We have two minutes left. Uh, here is what we've come up with with strategic fire breaks in our province which we believe the municipality should be enforcing in terms of the act. And they're not doing it. We've been trying for more than three years to get them to come on board. The FPA and the local people are trying to do it with the tribal authorities, not yeah. happening. Ladies and gents, this is my favorite slide. And it's a bit old. It's a 2021 fire area in the Moses Kutani district. And the reason for that is we took the statistics over 195 days. And in 195 days, the, municipal, the municipality at the fire brigade reported 192 fires, which is roughly one a day. We ended up by fighting 3,558 in the area. That is 18 fires a day. How can a municipality under-report like this? If they under-report, they're not going to raise funds. They're not going to have the money or be able to convince government. This shows you how the Fire Protection Association protected the town here, plus the agricultural college and the military grounds and the airport. But this was not fought by the municipality because they had one vehicle and you've got seven or eight or nine fires going at the same time. And they can only attend to one fire. This is a central business district and you can see our FPA members are trying to prevent the fire. The fire brigade service is not there. And this is not the only case of this that we are experiencing. There are statutory requirements. Basically, you've got to have equipment, you've got to have responsible people, you've got to have protective clothing, you've got to train your people, and government is not compliant. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look at what has burned, we are comparing the statistics for the last two or three years because that's what we could afford. We started with these statistics in 2021 when I was uh, elected as chairman. And we are now working on this and trying to bring in technology on board. We would like to invite you or request you to come on board as volunteers, if I can call it that, to try and assist us to save our community. Without our volunteers, people are gonna die. Animals are gonna die. And we are trying to protect lives, livelihoods, and the food security of our country and our province. And finally, please remember there's a link between fires, droughts, and the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. And soon we, we are going to take our, maybe I'll allow just one question because we've run out of time. I don't know if there's anyone has a question for them. Just we're just going to take one. I see Mr. Baker has a question. Yeah, thank you, Doc. Um, from your experience, what do you consider is an adequate width of a fire break? Um, 
In, in our province, the arrangement is that for a small property or a small holding, each neighbor must do three meters. But if you have, say, for example, 10 small holdings, you are allowed to make the fire break on the perimeter of the 10. But that must be reduced to writing, and then you can make a decent fire break. If your property is bigger than 25 hectares, we require six meters on either side. But what we do require is that the road reserve, the rail reserve, the Eskom lines, and the uh, teleco te telecommunication must also have reserves that are made now. If you have a transmission line, uh, it's a little bit bigger. If it's a distribution line, it's a bit smaller, but that is determined by the vegetation in the area and the topography. And then when you have the military, for example, where I showed you, the fire break there is about 100 meters from the road because they practice shooting when the winds are very strong because that's what they have to do. So the fire break is determined by the local fire protection association, reduced it to writing. It's agreed to at the AGM. People can come and comment. And that is dependent on the area topography and the, the biosphere itself. Um, I hope I've answered your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Christopher Dixego. I'm at the University of Botswana. And today I'm presenting on, uh, my topic is enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response. And I'm going to look at the overview of the strategies adopted by the National Disaster Management Organization of Ghana. So we already know what disaster is. If you don't, uh, at least I've provided a, a definition there. I don't want to waste the time and go over because already the time is very short. So Ghana government started this uh, by act of parliament in five ones, in act, act of parliament 517 established sorry. the national- Chris, Chris Hello, sorry, can you, you hear me? Yes, can you please put the PowerPoint, the presentation mode on? Okay. Is it good now? Yes, yes. perfect. Sorry okay. to interrupt. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. So I'm presenting on enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response. I'm going to look at the overviews or overview of the strategies adopted or employed by the National Disaster Management Organization of Ghana. And uh, <clears throat> because of time, I will not you know, go over certain things, but uh, Ghana started this uh, National Disaster Management Organization. Uh, but from here, I'll be using NADMO. Uh, in 1996, by Act of Parliament 517. And uh, basically, it has so many functions it plays, but one is to disseminate public information on human activities most likely to cause environmental disasters in Ghana. Actually, this presentation will focus on uh, uh, preparedness. You know, uh, disaster has three main phases, before disaster, during disaster, and after disaster. But this is before disaster. What are we doing to prepare our people, the, the vulnerable group of people? What are we doing to pre uh, prepare them to be able to be, uh, uh, to be fully prepared to face disaster when it strikes? You know, disaster, we can't, uh, especially the natural ones, we can't predict them. So it's very important we prepare the people. But somebody may ask, like, why do we have to worry ourselves preparing people when the government is, is there and I mean, institutions are there to do uh, what they're supposed to do? Uh, but I will say that a sense that, uh, am I audible? Disaster strikes. It takes time for government, especially the institution, they are in charge of managing a disaster to come there. The people will face it first, and then they will call the uh, then uh, 
institution in charge of uh, disaster to come. So in this case, there's a need to prepare these people so that before the institution come, uh, these people will know the necessary strategies and steps to take and uh, to, to, to work out something good for themselves. So it's very important you, you include them in the, in the preparedness planning so that they will be aware and they will also take necessary steps. And besides, it's also another strategy to, to bring in local technology, which uh, mostly uh, do, uh, those institutions managing disasters do not have. So that is why uh, this particular study is being carried out. So disaster preparedness is an essential component of disaster risk reduction and management. And it plays a crucial role in uh, saving lives protecting property and ensuring a timely and effective response to emergencies. So now uh, our objective is just to provide a description of uh, NADMOS uh, disaster preparedness strategies that they have used, and more specifically, community awareness and education, awareness creation and education. So we're looking into what NADMO is doing to, to, to handle these things. So now <clears throat> when we talk about disaster preparedness, we are looking into disaster, uh, it refers to the systematic and coordinated efforts and measures taken by individuals, communities, organizations, and governments to proactively plan for, mitigate the impact of, respond to, and recover from disasters. This is taken from the uh, UNDRR in 2017. And disaster preparedness takes so many forms. So let's look into the various one, the, the various forms. One is disaster risk, a disaster a risk assessment and hazard identification, where we identify the various hazards which can trigger disaster. We also do vulnerability analysis, uh, and then we also uh, look into the planning and policy development. You know, we, and during the planning, it's very important that you even include the people in the planning process. And then we develop policies that will help us to handle or to, to respond to uh, disasters. And also we have the public awareness and education. It's also part of the uh, preparedness process where we educate the people, we create awareness that this is what you have here in your community and this is and this and that is what is likely to happen. We also have the early warning systems. Nowadays, uh, we have uh, so many digital, uh, thanks to ICT, they, they have so many digital systems that we can put in place, which can even create an alarm or something. It, they make some sound especially in earthquake prune areas and flooding and whatever, before the earthquake will even erupt, it will start giving, blow some alarm for the people to start running away from the, the uh, uh, wherever the disaster, uh, uh, from the uh, hazard. So now let's go to the, the next one is the emergency planning and drills, where we test, we more or less like a mock, a mock exam or something where we try to create as if a uh, disaster has, has, has come and then what do we do? So we test our system to see whether they are functional, whether the people even remember the steps and other things that they have to uh, take. And also we have the resource stockpiling. This is mostly the, the challenging part, especially in most developing countries where uh, resources are, con where resource constraints and those things. But we need to stock you know, uh, resources in terms of money, food supplies, med medicines, and other things, so that when disaster strikes, we can fall on these things and then uh, uh, try to, uh, uh, like it's, it's going to be a bridge because definitely we need a place to put these people temporarily, then we find a, a, a final place for them. We also have the capacity building for, for both the, the, the staff of, for NADMO and uh, also the people who are the community. They also need some sort of training to help them. And we also have infrastructure and, and building codes. Yes, this is very important in the sense that, you know, uh, some countries, especially in South Africa, they have very strong building codes where you have to follow some instructions. So these building codes will tell you where to build and where not to build and even the kind of materials and so many things that you have to 
and even how to build the house. And uh, <clears throat> then the next is the community engagement, which is very important. It's very key because when you engage the people in all these processes, especially the planning and those stuff, they seem to own the process. They don't see it as this is for government, it's not for us, but they seem to own the, 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 the strategies that we have to use. And then when the, once the ownership comes in, they will naturally follow the, the strategies and other things. And also there's another important thing, which is continuous monitoring and evaluation. We need to continue monitoring and, uh, monitoring and evaluating our plans and, uh, and the policies and those things to see whether they are really meeting our needs. So now let's look into the effective uh, determinants of effective preparedness. And uh, most of the things have been said already there. One is uh, risk assessment and planning. It's very important. And uh, every effective disaster preparedness program or project should have this component. We also have the public awareness and education, early warning systems, uh, public, uh, community engagement, infrastructure and building codes, resource allocation. Uh, we also have training and building what capacity evacuation and shelter plans, continuous operation, continuity of operations, uh, research and innovation, legal and regulatory frameworks. These are all very important for us to have a very good uh, and effective what, uh, a good and effective uh, disaster preparedness uh, program. Uh, another thing, Two important things are also very important. Uh, that is the internal co uh, cooperation with collaborating institutions and other, even the countries next. You know, uh, there was a presentation about uh, the, uh, on fires. You know, they were mentioning even uh, uh, South Africa to come on board. These are internal corporations, you know, collaborating with neighboring countries and international organizations to share information, resources, and other in what? The handling these uh, disasters. And also we have the community resilience uh, burden, promoting long-term resilience by addressing social, economic, and environmental factors that contribute to vulnerability. So resilience here is that when disaster strikes, is it possible for the people to come back to their normal way of life? If it's not, then we need to do something because uh, we need to create uh, a resilient uh, 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 systems in place so that these people can really uh, easily bounce back to normal life even after uh, uh, disaster. So our methodology, we just simply use the uh, uh, document analysis, reports, publications, and those things to see our works. So from there, yes, uh, let's look into the approaches that NADMO is uh, using in Ghana to handle disaster preparedness. And uh, <clears throat> the first is community sens uh, sensitization workshops. So NADMO organizes workshops and training sections for the community at the community level to sensitize residents about the various types of disaster they may face, including uh, uh, floods, droughts, fire, and those things. So they, they, these workshops, they, they, it's more or less like with the people there, uh, the community people together with the, the leadership of the community. So we more or less look into uh, what uh, the things that are likely to happen to them if it's flood, if it's fire, if it's whatever we, you know, there, there should be an assessment. You know, in the planning process, we, we have the assessment where we see there's risk that are likely to happen to any uh, uh, to, to happen to any community. And this takes different forms you know what is the risk that is or uh, uh, that is uh likely to happen to one community is different from uh, the risk that is likely to happen to another community so the next one is a public awareness campaign not more conduct public awareness campaign to reach a broader audience these campaigns may include radio and television broadcast community meetings and distribution of educational materials and other things. So we also have the community-based disaster reduction, uh, risk reduction committees. Communities forming these committees who are trained, we train them to make sure that they have the necessary 
uh, skills that they, they, they're supposed to have to be able to handle these uh, disasters. And these groups are also very important updating, even running the monitoring, monitoring and, and evaluating the already existing policies and plans and make amendments to meet current needs. There's also another method that they are using, which is uh, school programs that not more collaborate with educational institutions to integrate disaster preparedness and resilience education into the curriculum. Uh, they go to schools and try to um, make sure that some of these things are pushed into uh, the, the sort of uh, training they give. And they even do this together with the, the, the Ministry of Education, where if you go into our primary schools, we have the environmental education and they teach them things of climate change, uh, floods, uh, earthquakes and all these things for them to understand so that they will know how to uh, handle these things. I mean, from the children, uh, from kids, you know, when these kids grow up, then they would, even when they go home, they try to uh, disseminate the information to their parents so that they also be uh, uh, prepared for, for, for any disaster that may come. So we also have the early warning systems where we fix the uh, NADMO fix uh, these gadgets, especially the, the technology, ICT-related gadgets in communities, and these things are uh, more or less, it gives them the, it creates like a, an alarm when a disaster is about to strike. So we also have the emergency response drills. Uh, that's I've already said, you know, uh, communities are pre prepared on mock drills to, and simulations to test the preparedness of community in in the in the in the event of uh, a disaster, <clears throat> there's also disaster outreach where NADMO staff and volunteers engage directly with community leaders and local authorities and residents to foster a sense of community ownership and response for disaster resilience. And there's also a distribution of educational materials where NADMO distributes educational materials to local people. And the, uh, mostly these materials are in local languages so that these people can also understand. There is also another part, which is the collaboration Chris, with Inch. Chris, you know, I'm going to interrupt you a little bit. We're running out of time, so I'm going to give you two minutes to finish off so okay, that we can- Okay, thank you very question. much. Thank you. Yeah. There's collaboration and also research and data collection. So in conclusion, I will say that the National Disaster Management of Ghana plays a crucial role in disaster preparedness and response and recovery. And community education efforts are a vital component of their work to enhance disaster preparedness and resilience at the, uh, root, at the grassroots level. Effective disaster preparedness is an ongoing process. It's not something that we can just, you know, finish. It's, it's an ongoing because new disasters even come, uh, comes up, especially in the advent of climate change where new things are coming, you know, communities are facing new forms of uh, disasters. And the disaster preparedness also requires a multifaceted approach that involves collaboration with local communities, agencies, NGOs, and so many people. So just as I said, disaster is very important. Uh, disaster preparedness is very important. And we also need the community to be part of this thing. If we don't involve the community and we try to take things in our own hands, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say that plans and strategies and other things will not work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher Sagowe. That was Christopher Sagowe from the University of Botswana, uh, talking about enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response. Uh, I don't know if we have any questions. I'm only going to allow one question. If we have any questions for him uh, before he goes, I believe he's still with us. Do we have any questions for him? Yes, ma'am. My name is Mary Christian. Good morning, everyone. And uh, his, his presentation sort of answers the question that I, I should have asked to the first presenter okay. because a lot of um, uh, cracks were identified on the side of that. End. And his presentation is for his integrating community members as part of the solution, you know, finding the maker. So for him, I just wanted to upload, not to say there was no part, maybe just the approach that. 
um, at, the, at the program that is currently facing our, our, our community. So him mentioning community engagement was like, wow. Yeah, because I mean, it is also giving a new dimension um, that uh, are coming from uh, education or so institutions of education. We always think that community engagement should be us, you know, um, using communities as, as, as our laboratories, you know, instead of investing in them and so that they would also be part of, you know, solution makers. Yeah, then. Excellent. Thank you very much, ma'am. I hope you got the comment, Christopher. Yes, I got some parts and some parts were fainting, but I I have something like uh, investing in the people to make sure that they also uh, becomes uh, a part of the solution, right? Yes, that's correct. She was talking about community engagement and how we can invest in yes. community, make sure that they become part of the solutions to the problems. So you got that one right. Yes, yes. Yes, I, I I got it. I got it very well. It's 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 a very important strategy, and uh, uh, mostly the 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 problem has been I this is because of the time I couldn't expand on certain things, but uh, the challenges you know they are facing so many challenges, and even to, to, uh, uh, implementing these ones that I listed, you know, it's even a problem on its own. So I am I'm very sure maybe with time these uh, strategies that you're talking about will be uh, considered. And but for now, the if not standards, yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Because of time, we are going to move on to our third presenter. Currently a registered postgraduate student to the University of Botswana, the Master of Arts in Politics and International Relations. Um, I've also been with the Investor of Botswana for just under seven years as a lecturer in the Department of Political and Administrative Studies. Uh, currently, I'm a member of Parliament uh, in the Parliament of Botswana. Um, and I also sit in various committees, uh, such as the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, um, SADC Parliamentary Forum, um, Inter-Parliamentary Union, uh, to name but a few. So uh, this is a paper called done with my um, colleague uh, Stanley Hiani, um, but I'll be doing the, the presentation. So that's just by way of introduction. Well, the paper is titled Democracy Deferred, Botswana's Response to the Coronavirus Pandemic and its Implications, particularly implications on, on democracy. Botswana, like the rest of the world, was faced with the unprecedented challenge of coronavirus pandemic, which was declared a global public emergency by the World Health Organization um, in January 2020. Now, following this, um, and following three confirmed cases in Botswana, the President of the Republic, uh, President Mokhitsimasi, swiftly responded to the threat posed by the virus by invoking a six-month state of public emergency in terms of the um, constitutional provision allowing him to do so. He subsequently summoned Parliament to affirm his decision as the law requires. So basically, um, this paper, uh, the main argument is that um, and we do we do this through documentary analysis. Um, we critically examine how President Masisi's government responded to the coronavirus crisis, and we look at um, how this impacted on the already deficient uh, democracy, whether in declaring the state of public emergency and managing the COVID pandemic, was the country prepared? Uh, how did the country fare? Did it conform to democratic principles? And it is contended that the government's response to the scourge of COVID-19 has revealed an inherent democratic deficit, particularly the inability of the government to be accountable, uh, to act ethically, uh, to be transparent, and to be adequately responsive. The government's response has revived concerns about further centralization of power in an already powerful presidency. 
um, we observe um, cases of corruption, non-accountability, secrecy, and unethical governance, as I've indicated. Um, it is also observed that the elites in the executive manipulated the coronavirus threat to consolidate their political power and relegated the primary public policy and lawmaking structure, which is parliament, to a spectator that rubber stems executive decisions. And there was no meaningful oversight provided by the executive or other institutions uh, to you know satisfactory levels. So how this presentation is, is structured is that uh, we provide a background, we discuss the declaration of a state of public emergency, uh, the provisions of the constitution in terms of what they entail about the declaration of state of public emergency. We also look at the, the conceptual framework methodology, um, we then discuss Botswana's deficient, deficient democracy, um, how you know the, there was non-accountability, how there was corruption, how there was mismanagement, unethical and unresponsive in government. We look at the security sector and human rights during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and then we, we draw into a conclusion. Now, as a way of background, <clears throat> um, as I've indicated, on the 11th of March 2020, the um, World Health Organization declared coronavirus um, outbreak as a global pandemic. And um, of course, there were concerns that the President of the Republic wasn't saying anything about this. Um, first to make an official statement was a former Minister of Health who outlined government response efforts to be carried out in terms of the National Public Health Emergency Preparedness Plan um, when he addressed Botswana Parliament on the 4th of February 2020. And as I've said, there were concerns that the President was silent about the, uh, the issue. So the Minister's statement was prompted by growing concerns, you know, about the extent to which really the country is, is prepared. Now, in, 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 in Botswana, the, uh, the, the disaster which is managed from the office of the president um it's 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 not of a, a health nature um as disasters such as uh, you know floods and you know such other you know calamities now those ones there is a fund which has money and when such instances arise uh, the, the the state will accordingly respond either by deploying uh, deploying the security forces and also deploying uh, resources however in terms of health, this is not how, you know, um, pandemics are, are managed. Uh, the Public Health Act um, provides for dealing with uh, epidemics or pandemics. Um, but, you know, there were worries um, during that time, for instance, that they were Botswana in Wuhan um, and how was the government assisting them. So generally, at the beginning, the government was criticized for delaying implementing um, international travel restrictions, including of tourists. And there were fears that as a landlocked country with porous borders, um, and looking also at the capacity of the healthcare system, are we going to be able to detect and cope with possible cases? So now following three positive cases, there was a declaration of state of public emergency on the 31st March for the purpose of taking appropriate and stringent measures to address the risks posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, effective midnight of the 2nd of April, 2020. Now the president declared the state of public emergency um, and, and declared nationwide lockdown, uh, or what he called extreme social distancing for 28 days and stated his intention to summon parliament uh, to come and you know uh, ratify uh, his decision uh, within seven days so parliament was convened on the 7th of april uh, 2020 after publication of uh, emergency powers uh, regulations uh, of the year 2020 and the regulations covered lockdown prevention of introduction or spread of covid 19 restriction of movement of people closure of facilities and miscellaneous provisions and parliament um, uh, met, uh, discussed, uh, and at the end of the day, you know, approved a state of public emergency for six months. 
um, I'll get into the issue of uh, uh, what transpired uh, in Parliament. Now, it is also interesting that, um, you know, to highlight uh, two points um, regarding the process of ratifying the president's decision in declaring state of public emergency. One is that Parliament was, was, was summoned. There was a General Assembly, which is a tradition of Parliament, to meet in an all-party caucus to discuss what is going to be discussed uh, in Parliament. Now, at that uh, um, all-party caucus, um, a government announced that uh, it will effect 10% car allowance um, for ordinary members of Parliament. You know, with the exclusion of ministers, president, because they have a leader of opposition, because they have access to official vehicles. And the president subsequently, you know, um, publicly uh, denied that this was a sweetener to members of parliament uh, to discuss the state of public emergency and, and approve it or, you know, favor his idea. So this is what happened during a uh, prior or prior to the, uh, to the debate. The state of public emergency was also, the debate was also, we also fast-tracked uh, because um, normally when parliament is in session, um, there are some health staff which are, were deployed uh, in parliament, like there's a clinic. During that time, parliament did not meet uh, in its chamber. It met in a, an open or slightly bigger venue, um, which was uh, one of the, uh, the halls uh, in the city. And there was also, you know, um, a, a clinic sort of set up. And so the, it was indicated that one of the nurses who were deployed to parliament tested positive uh, for COVID-19. It was a very controversial issue um, with indications that perhaps this was done to fast track the debate and to curtail uh, the, the debate or contributions or participation of uh, a key institution which is a uh, which is parliament um, and of course there was an attempt to litigate by that nurse because um the nurse disputed uh, you know the results because um of you know how uh, the whole issue was handled um uh, the statutory notice of intention to sue was issued by by the nurse now um when you look at the constitution of Botswana at section 17 um, the president can declare state of public emergency and the features of the said section are captured um, in the provision and articulated cogently by Edino uh, Kopila, um, who is a professor of law at the University of Botswana. That the president may at any time declare the state of public emergency or declare that it exists and that in instances where the declaration is made when parliament is sitting or has been summoned to sit within a period of uh, seven days, the period for which a declaration of state of public emergency shall have effect is a period of seven days from the date of publication of the declaration. And in instances where the declaration is made, when parliament is not sitting, the period for which a declaration of state of public emergency shall have effect is a period of 21 days from the date of publication of the declaration. The period can be extended by parliament through a resolution passed by a majority of all the voting members of the National Assembly. Now, the fourth, the fourth feature is that under Section 17 is that the National Assembly may not at any given time approve a declaration of state of emergency for a period in excess of six months. But it can, you know, at the end of six months, uh, approve it again for, for another six months, but it can't do it maybe for a year. The National Assembly may, however, subsequently vote, as I've said, to approve the declaration of a state of public emergency further periods. So the last feature of, of this provision is that the state of public emergency that has been approved by the National Assembly may be revoked at any time by Parliament. Now, um, of course, this must be understood within the, um, the, the framework of um, what Kenneth Good um as termed authoritarian liberalism i think we are going which is stop the recording uh, the recording his conclusion the, it's a little bit longer than botswana was a time. authoritarian liberal state um he observed that
just so that we don't run out of time, we are going to stick to time. So what we are going to do is we are going to share the recording with everyone so that you can have access to it. You can listen to it whenever you want. Maybe if you have any questions, we can always answer them at the close of this, the session, at the close of the day. But just so that we are on time, we are going to break for tea and coffee. Our tea and coffee is just next door. There is our DBL room, which is just very close to us. We are going to have tea and coffee. And then when we come back, we should please be on time. When we come back, we are going to have our keynote speech at Plain Petty. So please have your tea quicker and start coming five minutes before 10.30 so that we can start on time. Thank you.